skills in times of uncertainties because I, you, re, you wrote a lot about the uncertainties of our times. So the floor is yours. You have approximately 12, 15 minutes. So please go ahead. Pauline. I'll try to keep them in mind. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'd like to respond actually by saying that we, the Progressive Centrum in Berlin, consider ourselves not only partners but also friends of the Hungarian Europe Society and we're really grateful that we can be with you today. Thank you. So yes, as Ishvan said, um, I'm looking forward for our debate later and also to respond to uh, um, Adam and Janis and maybe side conversations. But for today's talk, I prepared some thoughts on uh, the issue that times of uncertainties right now are, as I think, very unhealthy, or you could also say harmful, and that I think we should respond by building re resilience. But when we speak about resilience, we mostly speak about institutions, democratic institutions. But since civil society is one of the major parts of, of healthy democracies, uh, I wanted to think a little bit about what does it mean to be a resilient civil society and what does it need for it. So, dear, dear audience, dear organizers and dear uh, speaking fellows, I would like to invite you to imagine that you come home from work and you try to put your keys into your door lock, but they don't fit. You try it again, you try to push the key inside the door lock, but it doesn't fit, it won't open. And you look at the key and you wonder if it's the right one or you took the one from office. But yes, it's the right one, but it won't fit. You don't get in. And you start wondering, how come my keys don't fit that door lock? Is the door lock wrapped? Or has someone changed the lock? And that is a very unpleasant feeling, right? Some creepy feelings creep up and you never had problems with that, with that lock. Okay, maybe your neighbor told you a couple of times that the one you're using is not that safe, and yes, you live in a neighborhood with a lot of burglaries, but you never really have that feeling that things could be wrong, that things could be that unsafe. Realizing that something you took for granted, like your apartment being safe, like your key, always fitting the door lock, is not that sure anymore, can be a bit of a trauma. You have relied on it, you considered it to be certain knowledge that things work out. You build your daily plans on it, of course, because you need to get inside, and maybe even your future. But then, in some cases suddenly, and in other cases slowly, a new reality sets in. Now, please imagine that this something is not your door lock, okay? in fact, but it's your daily routine of meeting people, of talking to them, of hugging friends. This is a reality that trembled and broke during the COVID crisis. Now imagine this something to be your principle, your value or belief that weapons should never be sent into war zones or your idea of the European peace narrative. This reality, for many, especially in my country, in Germany, trembled during the last 10 months. Now imagine this something to be Earth's future or the belief that your grandchildren will always be safe and happy on this planet or the unshakably belief, especially here in Hungary, that liberal democracy is safe. Well, all these fundamental certainties have been challenged during the last years. And this dissolving of certainties causes fear, sometimes anger, but for sure insecurity. And certainties are, many studies from various disciplines have shown that, very important for us human beings. We rely on them in order to make plans, that's nice, but we actually need them for our health to build trust, mental health, but also the physical one. The way we human beings create certainties is multifaced, as we all know. Sometimes we create laws in order to have a certainty. We create a right. In other cases, we develop something like a practice, an unwritten rule, a guideline uh, that shows us the way things should go. But it seems to me that only those certainties are considered reliable on an individual level that we experience, that we witness. For example, I know that the universal human rights exist. They exist as an entitlement, but I cannot actually rely on that they're being met. But the right of parental allowance, to give an example in Germany, however, I can be very sure of. Why? Because I've seen the right and practice so many times Certainties that are close in proximity and practically visible feel more secure than global treaties or laws I've never seen in practice. So let me summarize to this point. First, certainties are important for human beings 
individually and collectively for societies. Second, certainties feel more securing once they're experienced. And third, certainties are trembling. The phase in which we are currently living can be described as a time of uncertainty. Large societal groups like the economy, political sphere, civil society, the state, they work hard to bridge the, gra the gaps that have been cracking up. But as the crisis we are facing will firstly not simply end anytime soon and secondly not leave us with the world as it was before, we have to ask ourselves how do we reduce the risk of experiencing what I called a trauma before? By reducing certainties? by relying less on what we call them, certainties, or by developing a mode of resilience towards change. Surely there are good arguments for every of those options, and I'm sure, like in most cases in the world, uh, the magic mixture of the three of them might be the right way to go. But I would like to fo focus now on the last suggestion, on the resilience. Resilience, to me, describes the ability to cope well with change. Resilience Resilience also describes the ability to preserve the core, but to be able to make helpful adjustments around it. Democracies must develop better resilience to enable their citizens and civil society to walk the tightrope between the need for security and the need for change on the other. Most of the talk, as I said in the beginning, about resilient democracies is about institutions and how they must transform to adapt. But the large and indispensable part of democracy is civil society. In addition to their role as mediators between citizens and individuals and the politicians, they fulfill an important watchdog role, a watchdog function. Through their involvement, they often take care of human destinies, maintain valuable databases, analyze and evaluate situations, they mediate con contacts and they form opinions. So one aspect, just to name one example of democratic resilience that would be unthinkable without civil society is that of participation. For decades, civil society has driven research, experimentation and advocacy for greater civic participation. Today, many political policy makers, I see that in Germany every day, realize that the major change needed in our times of crisis can only be achieved peacefully through participation. Participation builds legitimacy, it improves representation, it may increase consent, and it can increase understanding of complexity. Civil society and its res resilience capacity is thus inextricably intertwined with the resilience of democracy. In order to become a more resilient society now, that's the question, what can you do? I believe it needs both, two ways. First, some guarantees by the national state, and if it's not given by the national state, it's needed additionally from the European Union. Second, efforts and claims from civil society poses on itself. I would like to give now four examples for each of the two ways. First, the guarantees by the state and or union. They must guarantee that civil society first is able to act, that means it is not hindered in basic communication, assembly, <coughs> money, acquisition or networking. Second, it has reliable resources when it comes to women power, funding, technical equipment and physical spaces. Third, it has live access to worldwide diverse information sources and can likewise spread their own gathered information live. Fourth and last, it is protected on and offline from hate and intimidation. So that's the first part. Now let me give you four examples of what civil society needs to do themselves in order to become more resilient. A resilient civil society first is able to prioritize goals and strategically set milestones. Second is self-critical and open for renewal in a way that it works methodologically, it communicates and it advocates. Third, it is constantly and as at its best professionally developing alliance building skills and applies the idea of intersectionality to its work. And last, it accepts the differences within civil society. But it shows solidarity when one of the other democratic NGOs is being intimidated. These two 
two lists are, of course, incomplete, but they are a start for a resilient framework of what civil society could be. We are currently not on a natural success trend towards what I have listed. In fact, the prominent Civicus and Road for Development Monitor, some of you might know, show that the quality of free space uh, for civil society maneuver in, in, in Europe is shrinking year by year. But the European Union, and thereby I mostly mean the European Parliament, has not overlooked this, this trend. Shortly after Russia's attack on the Ukraine, the EU Parliament held a debate in March 2022 on supporting civil society and they agreed on a vote on three highly rele relevant points. The first one goes, they call for a compre comprehensive civil society strategy and a European civic space index. Second, they recognize that civil society organizations need fair rules and financing across Europe. And thirdly, they repeatedly put out the point that EU countries should be obliged to provide an environment of free from threats and attacks. Just like the certainties I mentioned earlier, like the, like the parental allowance, these resolutions must be experienced in practice in order to unfold their strength. Financing across the EU, for example, must be real and reachable. If civil society in Europe wants to become more future-proof, defend its incomparable role for democracy and stabilize the bond between citizens and politics in the midst of the greatest transformation the world has been in for centuries, which is the ecologicalization of our economy and society, then it must in fact follow both tracks, as I said before. Pushing the European Union towards a more responsible role, demanding protection and support, especially when not provided by the national government itself. And second, transform itself towards an, on the one hand, flexible and open organization, on the other, a stable and reliable one. Last thought, resilience comes from an internal effort and external support. I wish I could say with certainty that both will come in Europe, but in times of increasing uncertainty, I'd rather say I believe in it, and I continue playing my role for it. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, I would like to raise just a very short and fast question, which is much more uh, actual political issue and maybe less theoretical or yes. what you what you talked about. Uh, what do you think about the example of the German football team regarding LGBT rights? Is it also a sort of expression of the civil society in a in a very controversial issue, especially in Qatar? With there might it might be a new issue. It's an uncertainty for many people how to deal with. Uh, with uh, LGBT rights. So, is this way to, to have a more uh, uh, comprehensive idea about uh, human rights, minority rights? So, would you support the German team, which, which tried, I think, to fight for these rights in this controversial environment? I think that they are not mature enough to take, to fully fulfill the role that they actually have, you know? supporting those basic human rights and showing showing this actually bearing this role of living those principles is not fulfilled they're not mature enough i would say to do so yes they try and little symbols but i would always say that's not enough and you know we don't need to look to qatar to talk about lgbti uh, unfriendliness and homophobia especially in sports in Germany, it is, it's so strong. And every other sector is, is developing faster. Politicians are developing faster. Having homosexual politicians is something quite normal by now. In the music sector, it's quite normal, you could say, in the economy as well. In sports, we are still in Stone Age. So I would say your role is actually, talking towards the team and, of course, the, the assembly, your role is much more and much greater, and you could do much more in order to, to, to stand in for those rights anywhere in the world, but maybe do it home first. Okay. Thank you. Uh